with primary research, I think another super essential component of it, which will always and has always been the moat for primary, basically that it boils down to questions that haven't been asked already. Whereas with secondary, the whole premise is someone has asked the question, maybe not, you know, gotten the direct answer and it maybe it can be manipulated to answer your question. But when you think about these forward thinking innovations or launches or features, if you have somebody having already reacted to or answered, it's actually not innovative. It might be helpful for a certain use case, but anticipating or kind of ideating is is even the best bot is going to average together what is known in the corpus of information that exists. And it's going to have a hard time wrapping itself around. We know a recession is coming or I'm aging and, you know, the dynamics of aging are changing. Whatever that is, a human will have that context and a bot, I'm skeptical if it ever will. So fun to have Victoria from Wonder on today to talk about desk research. Spoiler alert, uh, Googling is desk research, so we all do it all the time, but some great pointers on doing better desk research to folding it into your triangulation with primary and other forms of research. And we get into AI and speculation about the future. And it's just a really fun episode about things we do every single day and how to do them better as part of our research stack. So hope you enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Awkward Silences. Today, we're here with Victoria Sakel. She's the head of growth at Wonder. And today, we're going to be talking about desk research, which is something that we haven't really uh, talked about for a whole episode. So I think this will be really interesting to both folks who do a lot of desk research and maybe folks who do very little or none or don't even know what it is. So uh, really excited to have you here to be talking about desk research, Victoria. Yeah, excited to be here. It's kind of the the dark horse of the research world. So I'm excited to shed some light ah, on it. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. All right. So let's start from the beginning. Let's not overcomplicate things. Uh, what is desk research? So desk research at its core is mining anything that's publicly available. That's really as simple as it is. Sometimes called secondary research because it's not about talking directly to your you know, exact user, which is primary research, but that is what desk research is. Great, so is secondary research and desk research synonymous or? Yeah, exactly. And maybe to paint the picture of the broader research landscape here, you have yeah. your primary research, so that's going either through quantitative surveys or qualitative conversations uh, to your actual user base. Sometimes in an expert networks can be a little bit of hairy um, zone in terms of whether it's actually primary or secondary, because it's not usually your buyer you're talking to, but primary is kind of, you're, you're hearing it direct straight from the horse's mouth. You have um, this other tier of sort of behavioral or social insights. So they're not exactly answering a question or, or talking about you, you know, to answer exactly what you're looking to, to learn from them, but you're watching what they're doing or you're monitoring what they're saying on social platforms or otherwise. And then you have secondary or death, which is sort of this foundation of underneath everything, which is what people are doing, you know, could be mining different data sets. It could be reading other people's research reports, but the idea is it exists somewhere, whether in your organization or outside on the internet. In the old old days, it was in books, um, right. but it exists and you can kind of use that as a foundation for most of your research. Um, and so that's where it tends to get interesting in that uh, most people, some people are unfamiliar with the language desk or secondary. Most people do some version of it. If you right. use Google for um, forget about like which Thai restaurant to go to dinner, but also, you know, what's the competitive landscape or what's the latest on trend X, Y, Z. You've done some form of desk research, um, but it actually ends up being a lot more of professional's time than sometimes we care to admit. Um, but also then we, we talk about, like we talk about the formal costly, you know, six month push for this many interviews or survey respondents, but we don't tend to talk about um, the due diligence we tend to do that forms the foundation of decisions or research efforts or strategy plans and the like. Yeah. Awesome. You make a great point that sort of one person's primary research can be another person's secondary or desk research. So mining that research that was done maybe months or even years ago in your organization to see if it's relevant now can be actually a great form of, of desk research. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure we'll get into some of the trade-offs when you think about these different types of research. With desk, you tend to find it's not going to be perfectly relevant. So for example, you might have a question around uh, a new market that you're thinking of entering with an existing product. You might have a lot of historical context around why that product uh, was introduced in North America, but not in this new market. And Mm -hmm. so there's that relevance factor and then sometimes a recency factor as well, um, especially with the speed and pace of research being conducted conducted and published today. Um, There's trade-offs with the kind of that we think about the margin of error, the level of fidelity that you need uh, with different types of research that you're using, but also the different stage you're at with the decisions you're making or the plans you're setting. So usually it's fine. You can you can get by and get knowledgeable enough to be dangerous with desk research. Um, but there's always that nuance of it's not exactly the answer you need most of the times. Sometimes it is, but most of the times you have to kind of layer on your own um, kind of follow up to that that finding or data point or whatever it is. Great. Yeah. So I'm gathering it might be a good method to kind of put in your stack alongside some other methods if you want to triangulate or, you know, find a, a fuller picture. So it's, it tends to be pretty powerful when you need um, sort of a state of the union. You want to take stock of um, in any information that might have been collected, get a first kind of dip into the state of consumers or the category or different trends. Um, we like to think about it when, you, you know, you have types of information that you have and types of questions that you need answered. You sort of have your known knowns, the things you feel pretty good about. You don't necessarily need to spend more time on, although desk research can also be helpful for corroborating and just, you know, providing that last level of confidence that you've you've got your knowns down. You've got your um, known unknowns. So these are the questions that you're probably about to spend more time or money or you know budget, whatever, investing in getting answered. And then there's these uh, unknown knowns. So you might have this information in your organization that tends to be mining uh, behavioral data or you know spend or category data, that type of a thing. And then your unknown unknowns. And so that last piece is also pretty powerful for desk research, where uh, you may need to triangulate some things and you know augment um, any of your or known information with some of these additional pieces or, or kind of almost spotlights on the gaps in your knowledge. Um, but we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we help people surface what they don't know? They think they're going into a research project. They think they have one question to get answered, which might still be true, but there might be all these different elements of it that you you also want to surface. And so we we tend to think of it as a tip of the spear. It tends to be, if you do it the right way, it, it, you know, have the right tools, which obviously we're biased, but you know, we're one of them. If you have the right tools, it can be pretty quick and easy. It doesn't have to be a big, slow delay to your effort or your your work plan, uh, but get up to speed on what might exist already. Get some of those um, kind of proxies for information that you, you might be looking to double down on. And then you can go into a more formal research effort with a lot more context than the problem you're trying to solve, um, but also a better sense of what are you actually trying to answer and knowledge gaps you're trying to close. Yeah, that's a great point. And so do folks often, uh, and like you mentioned, people are doing desk research, whether they call it that all the time in their daily work lives. Um, do you recommend kind of jumping in and maybe doing a little informal desk research before even putting together a research plan often? Or is that a piece in your existing plan and you kind of want to make sure you can contextualize how it's going to fit into a larger plan? Yeah, I think it's a it's a both um, situation. Uh, the first thing I'll always like guide clients with is think about your constraints. So if you're time strapped, your budget constrained, and you just need to get quick answers, sometimes that means jump right into the survey. Sometimes that means actually spend the extra a couple of hours doing the due diligence to get uh, you know something in front of your CEO or whatever it is faster. There's also an element of what level of accuracy and, and precision do you need in the information that you're sourcing to make a decision or recommend an approach, whatever it is. Um, Again, desk research might not be the most precise, but it will be quick and it can be close enough in some cases. Um, Other times, primary research and having those direct quotes from what people are experiencing or needing can be what you need. Um, But there's there's typically an element of, you know, is it helpful to get take stock of what you already might know? Is there an element of um, we need to have something that's directly tied to our audience or specific to our business to take those answers back to whatever your stakeholders uh, might be looking for or to your own team, that type of thing. Great, great. Uh, Cool. So let's talk about some more specifics. So what are some tools that you might use to answer different kinds of questions to do different kinds of desk research? 
Yeah, so typically the landscape breaks down into Google and search engines, which a lot of us are um, intimately familiar with. And now lately, there are a lot of LLMs. So you can turn to the generic LLMs like GPT, Bard, now Gemini, Claw, and the like. There's also a whole category of AI-powered research tools. Um, We've kind of pulled together and mapped that landscape to understand are they uniquely AI tools? Are they tools that used to be for something else that they've sort of layered in different AI and LLM components? Some of them are purpose built for, for example, mining PDFs. We talked about other research that might have been published online. If you've got a PDF of a report, you can run it through and, and get the full kind of download. Um, in other cases, you know, they're free and you're getting a trade off in quality there. In other cases, you're going to pay for a subscription to get more kind of um, robust citations or um, you know, roundups of information. Uh, but really it boils down to Google. You can sometimes pay a outsourced, um, you know, freelancer or contractor to do this research, but they're ultimately going to use Google or uh, LLMs. Um, and then, you know, LLMs is kind of the current state. So, um, you know, the last sort of subcategory of that would be with a company like Wonder, where we're combining LLMs and the AI horsepower with humans who actually use all these tools, but are trained up on not only Boolean search and all the search engine um, type of skill sets, but also plugins, prompt engineering, and all the skills that are super important for getting the most out of LLMs, which is tending to be um, quite a time suck for a lot of professionals who are trying to stay on top of the latest trends and the tools and the technology and get the answers that they need and do their day job. So that's kind of the landscape. It's, It's actually pretty, pretty simple. Awesome. Yeah. It's simple at a high level. And then once you get into it, so you're starting with you have some questions like to use your your two by two. You've got some known unknowns that, you know, you know, you want to dig into those. And, you know, I can imagine you sort of list them out. You have an outline of questions. Right. And then you're going to either Google it, LLM it or work with a, a service like Wonder and get some answers to these questions. This is where, you know, uh, there's no shortage of information in the world, right, at your desk or otherwise. So what are some methods one might use to kind of dig through this information, synthesize it, fact check it, make sure this is good information, and then get it into a right synthesized form that we can actually use to distill the answers to some of these big questions? Yeah, we actually think about it um, in terms of a, a knowledge assembly line, if you will. And so the first stage that tends to take people most time right now is rounding up all of this information. So I'm sure we can all uh, resonate with spending hours either in the the doldrums of Google or on page 14, you end up with a document with a bunch of links. You need to then click into the links, read the things. You go down a rabbit hole of more links. Sometimes you need to refine your search and, you know, tighten whether it's geography or the nature of the question that you're asking. So this first step is sort of um, collecting and and accruing all of the types of responses or links or resources that you might have at your disposal. Of course, I'm not mentioning the upstream. There's sort of refining your thinking around what's the question I'm trying to answer and, you know, what are my objectives? That kind of goes without saying. But once you've got this long working, you know, raw input list, to your point, there's typically an element of verification. And that can include, is this actually a link? As we'll see with LLMs, you'll sometimes get hallucinated URLs or totally made up bullets that you need to go like confirm is this even something that happened or you know something that someone said. Um, on the Google side, you sometimes need to verify are the, the links that I'm getting actually something I would trust? Would I forward this on to my CEO? Is it a one-off blogger who you know had a end of one experience and is claiming that that's the future of whatever the topic is. So there's the the kind of credibility and the verification in that sense. From there, uh, there's usually a prioritization of or an organization to say, you know, this fits in theme one or this is finding two. Um, so kind of doing all that thinking around how do you organize the information but all tying back to your original objectives, which over time, you might also be finding there's you know, part one, part two, part three, that as you go down these rabbit holes, there's some findings that you're surfacing. Um, and then there's the element of, I didn't fully get this answer. So how should I go about doing that? Is there a triangulation to your point earlier? Um, Might I intersect a few different data points or connect a few of the different findings to find something close enough? Do I hold on this and address this in quant or, you know, other forms of primary research? Um, And then there's the whole element of like storytelling. And this is a huge part of it that becomes a challenge when you start with these 
dumps of links. You've got this big working document and you're, you have to share it with someone probably, even if it's just saving it for your own findings. Um, you know, I tend to, when I'm collecting links on things, I, I kind of save them in messy docs, but I'm never comfortable sharing my own working documents with my stakeholders. And so there's elements of, is this a, a written report? Is this um, a PowerPoint? Is it something more robust and, and dynamic? When you think about like a market map, you might actually want something that you can sort and filter by. Um, that piece can tend to be pretty heavy and intense as well. So again, we think about sort of your knowledge assembly line, going from your initial question, collecting all your raw inputs, organizing into um, sort of like working themes or topics, and then figuring out how you share out and present. Um, and then you get into the, now I analyze and what do I do with this information and what are the recommendations right. I'm basing off of it? Is it Useful to begin with uh, an artifact, a medium, uh, an output you're going to create in mind at the beginning, or should the research as it comes together kind of guide the right format to summarize this information? Yeah, it's a great question. We think about it in a couple of different ways. The first part is that the answer is both and that you you want a sense of something that you're trying to hone in on, but being open to and pulling the threads. And the second piece is the types of questions that you ask. And so we talk a lot about there, there's roughly five or so types of questions sometimes. Um, and, and we see this vary based on who the question asker is, um, both in terms of their function as well as their seniority. But sometimes you want early signals and guidance around a topic. So that would be more of like an exploring question that, you know, tell me the state of um, hot sauces in Italian food. Just give me any of the things that you can find. Sometimes you want to chisel and you want to understand all the different angles that might be relating to a different topic. So when we think about, um, for example, I just ran research on research repositories as a space. What are all the different like ways companies are approaching this? Because it's not just one. There's a few different types of solutions. There's a few different, you know, subcategories. And so I want to paint actually a full picture and sort of chisel away at my original topic and, and get to something um, more finite and, and discreetly clear. Um, anyways, there's a few different types of ways you can go about this, but usually it depends on, um, are you trying to converge and, and narrow down mm -hmm. your thinking mm -hmm. and your understanding of a topic, or are you still at the divergent phase where you're looking to um, explore and, and widen your aperture to capture all the different angles that you might need to be thinking about at this stage? Yeah, fantastic. I definitely want to get into how different teams, different uh, roles, marketing, product, business leaders, et cetera, can use desk research and use it alongside perhaps primary research. That might be a good segue to talk about some of the research you're doing about research and what you're seeing in that research. So this will all make sense when you start talking. It's very meta, very, very meta. Yeah, it's been quite an exercise. But the idea is that, again, companies go from having some sort of business objective growth, market share, you know, entering a new market, whatever it might be. And if you work all the way upstream, there's some sort of question that needs to get answered. There's some sort of work plan that needs to get laid out. And so the first thing I'll say is as we think about that pipeline, so to speak, um, you, you start with ideating. We talked about exploring and, and kind of widening your aperture. Then you narrow it down and you prioritize what you might want to focus on. Um, you might validate before you prioritize. You might validate after you prioritize. But, you know, is there a there there would be something you'd spend time on. And then you develop and you test and you roll out and then you iterate from there to see if the impact that you're trying to achieve is achieved. So when you think about that whole pipeline, what we were wondering was uh, what are the questions that different companies and different stakeholders are asking, who are the different stakeholders responsible for different stages of that pipeline, and how do the things and the information needs that they have vary not only across the pipeline, but within a given pillar of it. So when you think about setting your strategy, you might start with um, a very specific decree from the board or the CEO. You might start with what do our consumers need? Like, what is a pain point that we might just think about? Or what is a new flavor of, you know, Doritos that we think that we can introduce and, and solve a new problem that no consumer ever thought that they had? But by the time you hit the end of that strategy stage, 
you might have narrowed it down and there's some sort of, even if it's not explicit, there's some sort of stage gate that'll say, okay, we've got our strategy. We know what we're trying to achieve. Now let's go to ideation. And then the same thing happens as you move down that pipeline. Um, so our, our exercise was to talk to a number of different stakeholders. You just mentioned everything from um, product and user experience to up, downstream marketing to upstream strategy teams. Um, and then a number of different stakeholders in between to understand what their remit is, what questions they're asking, what tools they're using, what their pain points are with those tools. And then to your point, how are they intersecting things like primary, secondary, and all these other different types of data and research to get the answers that they need to those questions? Yeah. Great. And what do you learn? Yeah. So um, the first thing I'll say is that, you know, every company, of course, has their own variation of their their pipeline and the stages that they use, but they all do tend to map to that continuum. And the second piece is the, the remit of different stakeholders. So again, I mentioned marketing and product marketing will tend to be later stream. It's interesting when you intersect that with the maturity of a company where great marketing and great product marketing will actually tend to be involved pretty upstream as well. And then similar to user research, it's not just plugged in at one stage. It sort of has the halos of user research will come back post-launch and user researchers will be part of the conversation that go into development and not just, you know, tag you in and, you know, see what they said about this prototype. So kind of thinking about that ecosystem approach is, is really interesting. Um, the other piece is when you think about the level of confidence that companies are looking for today. Um, first of all, we do see that every company is using internal data. Um, and if you're not, you, you know, kind of mining and don't have that infrastructure, um, anybody who talked about it expressed pain with how difficult it is to get that information. And it, it wasn't in a it's fine, we moved on without it. It was a, you know, this is a real weak spot for us way. Um, the second piece is, you know, increasingly trying to move towards agility where, where can we get something that gives us a grain of insight around, again, the strategy, the market, the category, the consumer that helps us then get tighter around what do we need answers to, or, you know, what are we not getting from existing research, whether it's internal or, or desk research externally, um, to help us in, inform how we can start moving forward quicker instead of always needing to like check off all the boxes and be done before we move on to the next stage. Um, the last thing is, you know, again, I mentioned this at the top of the conversation that it's sort of this dark horse where everybody is spending a ton of time on Google. And I felt this as a consultant who, you know, had to get smart fast on any category or client we were kicking off a project with. But you have everyone from, of course, the, you know, middle level kind of team members to very senior executives spending either their day, part of their day job or, you know, nights and, and weekends kind of trolling through Google to get smart on different, different topics. Um, um, so it's interesting when you think about different, you know, primary research conversations have always been part of the conversation where you've got to have a budget and you've got to have a certain time to execute and new solutions like user interviews, like um, any number of these new tools are making it quicker and easier to do primary research. But the secondary research space hasn't really been tackled. And now we've got LLMs, but they've got their own challenges. Yeah, for sure. Like the hallucinations you mentioned and uh, uh what do you call it? Uh, uh, prompt engineering, right? Just being good at using it. We've all had uh, decades to learn how to use Google. And there's probably still many people out there who don't know Google Scholar exists, right? <laughs> you know, um, so, right, a lot of education to do in terms of using these new tools well, but uh, also fact checking them and making sure the information that you're getting is is good information. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's been interesting even to see that people are feeling optimistic about AI. There, there's definitely caution, there's some skepticism, but there's generally optimism around using tools like AI. But in any of the conversations I was hearing, it was sort of like, it can help me do things a little bit faster, but that trade-off then comes into exactly what you're saying, the validation, the credibility. And so we get into this problem where people are spending lots of time either on Google or in the LLMs. And yet they're all still feeling like when we have that we have the surveys, we have the conversations with them, they're all still feeling like I need to be doing more of the landscape assessments and the consumer insights and some of these higher level but pretty foundational, you know, we go back to the, the four P's and the five C's, like people still need ongoing insight into those things. And they're too one off right now because it's such a time suck to do the Googling and the, you know, LLMing, whatever the right, verb right, is there right, right. to get those answers. Right. Uh, any trends in the kinds of questions people are asking that you're seeing come through? 
Um, so the two levels of this are the types of questions, which are pretty consistent. So landscape, um, competitors, consumer dynamics, there's a lot of questions relating to sizing. So ROI and, and SWOT. And then the second piece would be on literally what people are worried about. Um, right. Of course, a lot on AI and, you know, how do we use it? What should we be thinking about it? But also what are our competitors doing? What's happening in the space? Um, beyond that, it's been actually fascinating. We have everyone from, you know, banks and financial services to a number of consulting, you know, firms, even CPG and the minutia of the types of questions and the, the very specific things that they're asking suggest that, you know, you might typically go to primary respondents for these types of answers, but actually there is enough out there that they're coming back again and again for good insights on some of these, you know, chemicals and people's perceptions of this, that, and the other thing. Um, but I, I can imagine, and I, again, as I experienced in our own research effort, you can get smart pretty quickly on what's out there. And then the questions that you layer onto it with primary research, only 10 X is the level of insight versus just, you know, starting at zero and going to going to 10, you can take it even further because you've started at 10 now with that foundation. Yeah. I'll ask you a kind of speculative question, but maybe one rooted in observation, which is with AI and with this, you know, really potential exponential speeding up of gathering of secondary information that's happening, right? Uh, where do you see primary research evolving alongside that? Where is it most useful when you can get so much I guess, breadth of information, right? Uh, otherwise, how do you see that evolving in terms of uh, the value of primary research? Yeah, it's a great question because I think going back to some of the, I won't call them like downsides or flags, but just the nuances of secondary research is the nuance around the why, first of all, is always going to be challenging. Like you can get a certain level of that from somebody else's published report, but they probably aren't asking it with the same context in mind as you are. Um, and then the nuance around the exact type of person and, and your why, like why you are asking the question and whether that's reaction to a user experience or the flavor of a chip or whatever it might be, um, the perfect answer is probably not going to exist, but a pretty close answer will. And so um, when you think about that, getting to that perfect answer and having much more confidence, uh, whether it's to ship a you know version of a prototype or, or otherwise, that feels like it's only more important from a primary perspective. It's also where you get into this interest. I'm interested if you guys have had the conversation or, or seen it come up, but synthetic respondents to me feels like desk research jammed into a primary person's bot or bot's sure. body. Right, right. Um, yeah, I don't know where that will head, but yeah, I'm not well, we have a healthy skepticism that. of that, of course, right? You always want to be on the cutting edge of technology, but uh, we're hoping that humans remain an important part of research on the the participant side for sure. But but very interested to see how we've seen also AI on the other side, on the moderator side. Again, hopeful that moderators have some value as reading body language and adjusting to the responses and, you know, that human to human connection. But are there cases where maybe it's not necessary? Probably, right? So it's figuring that out. What's that depth of why that I need that depth of information and how do we use primary kind of one-on-one -on -one research to really validate and really get to that emotional core of things that we can't do through some of these cheaper, faster, more scalable methods. Yeah. You raised a good point though. Um, with primary research, I think another super essential component of it, which will always and has always been the moat for primary is basically that it boils down to questions that haven't been asked already. Whereas with secondary, the whole premise is someone has asked the question, maybe not, you know, gotten the direct answer and it maybe it can be manipulated to answer your question. But when you think about these forward thinking innovations or launches or features, if you have somebody having already reacted to or answered, it's actually not innovative. I mean, it might be helpful for a certain use case, but anticipating or kind of ideating is, is even the best bot is going to average together what is known in the corpus of information that exists. And it's going to have a hard time wrapping itself around, we know a recession is coming or, you know, I'm aging and, you know, the dynamics of aging are changing, whatever that is, a human will have that context and a bot, I'm skeptical if it ever will. Yeah, no, it's a great point. Uh, you talked about what the Doritos before. It's uh, <laughs> uh, you could learn a lot about America's favorite 
uh, flavor of Doritos. Is it nacho or Cool Ranch? I don't know. I think Cool Ranch is the best, but you can learn a lot about that, but it won't tell you what new flavor to create, right? You can see gaps in the market, but yeah, there's a, that's a, a great point that innovating made more possible by what do you actually, you know, ascertain from that human connection and um, and also the PII side, right, where they, someone might have asked these questions before, but they're not going to just be broadly available uh, to the world for, for security and privacy reasons as well. Yeah, I'll be interested to see how things might unfold with publishing research results, knowing that AI is getting even better with um, mining what is publicly available. Obviously, a lot of these things were published. There's the whole ungated conversation as well. They were published with the intent of being consumed publicly. But um, if we'll start to see that people are being less liberal and sharing their research results because AI can pick it up and, and, you know, surface that insight and answer for anyone and everyone now. Yeah. You mentioned the pipeline of research and converging and diverging. Are you seeing folks or, or most of your clients, for example, or what you see folks using kind of upstream at that early level? Or is it everywhere in the decision-making process that, that this kind of research can be useful? It does tend to come in early half of that pipeline, I'll call it. Things yeah. like development and testing, there's obviously a different type of research that it tends to be prominent there. But I'll also say that within each of those steps, it's the top half of the step sure, where you tend sure, to sure. diverge and collect your information. And then the bottom half is more about refinement, thinking, synthesizing, and then heading into the next step where you you know, would tap this type of research again. Yeah, interesting. Cool. Uh, what else, what else though should we cover about desk research that I didn't ask you? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, maybe even taking a step backwards because something we talk about and think about a lot at our company is this whole concept of curiosity and asking questions, um, where the dynamic that Google has, um, created is created a lot of access to information. Um, but in a professional context, again, we talked about how much time it takes to find these answers and we have day jobs that are not typically go and sit on Google and, you know, explore sure. the things and get answers. Um, we've sort of combined that with our natural tendency as adults who've grown over time and needed to have answers to questions to stop asking as many questions. And so something we're, you know, of course, trying to get answers to people quicker, but actually just open up more space that people can ask more questions and explore more ideas. And so this element of curiosity um, is as helpful for just having time and headspace to explore different threads and see what comes of them. But also when you think about where innovation come from, whether it's a VC or in a company or otherwise, the 80-20 rule is how businesses grow, right? The more questions that you can ask and the more um, opportunities or threads or bets that you might be able to explore, the better chance one of them is going to, or more of them, 20% of them are going yeah. to really be the future of your business. So you combine that with this idea of how do you get um, in incrementally more confident in the information you're collecting, do a little bit of desk research and get that much tighter. Uh, we think a lot about the one in 60 rule in aviation is that a one degree change in your direction at your starting point over the course of 60 miles can change your ending point by about a mile. And so that could be great or that can be really right. bad if you're really off course. And so spending right. that extra second or, you know, in our case, we've gotten it down to a matter of hours instead of spending a week due diligence a topic, spend the extra time, ask the extra questions. So you're not only expanding your portfolio of opportunities, but um, building that muscle in yourself and in your organization and ideally tightening your precision with landing in the right place. Yeah. You bring up an interesting point, which is, I wonder, you talked about the known unknowns, but then there's the, the known unknowns as well. Are there habits or cadence of asking I don't know, just sort of out there questions that can be helpful for keeping that curiosity going, right? Um, you mentioned competitive research. You want to keep an eye on your competitors. There are these things you probably think to look at on an ongoing basis. But is there a way to kind of nurture that habit of staying curious about things you might not even know you should be curious about to keep that edge? I think part of it will come down to that, again, professionals are strapped for time and don't even right. have the headspace. And we always talk about freeing up time on your calendar to just like think and strategize. Never 
really happens. It's hard to do, but there's an element of like, how do you create that space to be thinking and wondering and not jumping to the answer? So um, plenty of ways to build your curiosity and question asking muscle. The other side, and this is what's unique about our AI that's built into our platform is it's actually a divergent thinking model. We've done this for a decade now and have a you know ontology of all the types of questions that intersect on the back end to say, if you're doing a competitive landscape, here are 10 things you might want to think about. Or once you've done the competitive landscape, here's five different directions you might want to go next. And so when you're talking with our chatbot around, I want a competitive landscape of all the research repositories out there, it's going to come back to you and ask thought-provoking questions. Are you interested in this? Are you interested in that? We tend to find that about 95% of the people who come through and start with one question end either with right. another or with a you know 10x version of the question because just practicing the have you thought about this or yes and that you know improv emphasizes pretty heavily can can be pretty powerful for just expanding thinking that way. Yeah, be careful with those questions. They tend to beget more questions <laughs> to your point. Yeah. I think also it'll be interesting, this is super speculative, but just with AI and again, just the speed of uh the passing of information that's rapidly happening where more questions and answers can obviously be processed now than before. Probably the brain's capacity to retain them has not grown as fast, you know, and so I do think more and more of our intelligence is sort of sitting outside of our brains, but hopefully easily accessible on demand. But I think that's interesting, right, how that's going to change how we work and how we think where we just can't like we can't double triple the size of the capacity of our brains but can we answer questions quickly when we need to i think so yeah that's where we started exploring this research repository space if nothing else to help our clients figure out how to mine this almost internal corpus of the brain of the organization right. because right. as there's all these new ways to get information as they're becoming more accessible and as we have AI that we can unleash on this internal body of everything from product data to social listening findings to primary or secondary research findings, um, getting all of this in one place, avoiding duplicating efforts, connecting dots. We talk a lot about collecting the dots. So we talked about that big Google sheet of all of your links. And then there's actually the so what that happens from that, the, the connecting of the dots and figuring out the implications, that's where tools like research repositories will be interesting and in not just being dumping grounds for all of these different documents and files, but actually helping to mine insights and draw connections and be predictive in terms of, it looks like, a, you know, suddenly this category is coming to your website a lot, like either monitor right. it or intersect right. that with social listening commentary around what this category is talking about and reroute your messaging because of that. Um, but, but figuring out how to stay on top of all of these these gold mines of insight and, and surfacing actual actionable information from that will be, I think, the next frontier here. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. All right, let's do some rapid fire. Uh, what is your favorite research method, maybe aside from secondary research, although go ahead, uh, or interview question? Yeah, something you like to ask the bots or the people. Yeah, probably both uh, related, although I will avoid talking to the research bots as long as I respond in bots <laughs> as long as I can. Um, Thinking about how you can be as agile as possible with research is always is fun to me. I started my career at Kantar where um, very robust and talented research efforts in place, but they were slow and they were expensive. And um, working with a lot of companies on the West Coast, it became clear that we have to think about getting answers in creative ways. So I tend to um, explore with candidates how, you know, if you had no budget and you had the same time constraints, how would you find answers to all these different types of questions, whether it's competitor, category, um, you know, consumer insights or whatever. And so understanding the different tools, A, that they might be aware of that I'm not, but B, that they, um, you know, would, would put into their research stack and, and use a little bit more iteratively and agilely is always an interesting exercise. Yeah. Awesome. Love that. Uh, some resources that you like for information on research, doing research, tools, things that you recommend to others or use a lot yourself. Yeah. Um, 
perhaps intuitive given I ended up in desk research, but I do spend a lot of time reading different newsletters and podcasts and kind of mining together the the dots of, you know, what Lenny talks about and what, you know, Scott talks about in his newsletters, Seth wrote in. But for me, it's about crossing a lot of disciplines as much to understand different approaches and how people are, um, you know, thinking about their business or product strategy as it is getting a good empathy, a level of empathy for what different organizations and functions are working through, even within my organization. So um, happy to share additional resources, but like Lenny's podcast is great on the product and the strategy and the innovation side. There's a number of different podcasts and newsletters that I um, to tend to kind of scan over the course of a given week. And then the other piece of it is around um, a little bit more interdisciplinary, but when you think about asking questions or curiosity or um, how do you explore innovation, uh, there's a lot that comes from science and kind of experimentation strategy. There's a lot that comes from uh, academia. So any of those intersections of actual ways to build a business and then actual ways to think about asking questions and building the curiosity muscle are where I spend a lot of my time. Awesome. Uh, Lenny and Scott, Scott Galloway, Pivot, different one? Um, I'm Scott Clary, actually. Oh, uh, Scott Clary. Yes, okay. yeah. Nice. Yes, yes. I was like, what's yeah. Scott? Uh, yeah, we'll have to get those links and put them in the show notes for sure. And where can folks follow you? Are you on, are people still tweeting? Are you threading? Are you LinkedIning? <laughs> where, where are you? I am, I'm on LinkedIn. I um, have not come back to X and some of the, um, <laughs> some of the heyday there. Same, but same. I... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been really interesting and I learned a lot and I'm sure our listeners did as well. I'm happy to hear it. Thanks and have a, have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs> yeah, you too.